<clears throat> I wanted this maybe kind of be a last call testimony about where God brought me from. I know I've done a few of them, but this one I'm going to try to go into a little in depth. Um, not detail wise, but a little in depth of what I went through. Um, as I have told many of you here on the YouTube circuit, the Lord Jesus Christ freed me, delivered me from many things. The most important thing was homosexuality. Um, I was in it because at the age of four, I was taken advantage of by an 18-year-old boy. He told me, it's our little secret, tell nobody what happened. I was only four years old, and he pretty much took my innocence, okay? It hurt, but even more what hurt me was through life after that happened to me. I um, wasn't molested many times as a child, but only I was the one doing it. I was letting people do it because I thought it was what I was supposed to do. Because I had been mentally molested at the age of four to think that's who I was. Then I had a female cousin who is on my dad's side who um, dressed me like a girl and it gave me uh, the actions of a female. And at school I was called names, names I will not repeat, but I was called names that were very hurtful. I had a few, one or two people try to force me at school and I actually got away from them. Um, and growing up in my childhood I had one true friend who I almost destroyed that friendship by thinking I had to do acts with him, but I didn't. He didn't have to have that. He, he liked me for who I was. His sibling, however, uh, one of them, was only a friend because of that. And there was many other people in the neighborhood that were, well, there was like three other boys that were only friends with me because of that. Now, I did have a few friends here and there through life that were truly friends. They never once looked at me that way. See, the truth of the matter was I never truly realized my one true friend was Jesus Christ. When I was growing up as a young child, I went to church. And there was one church I went to. And to this day I call the, the pastor's wife, which the pastor is, he passed away a few years back, I think in 2013. But um, I'm also going to post this on Facebook so that some of my friends I went to school with will know the truth behind why little Cecil Burdett was the way he was in school. I was kind of the type of kid that didn't talk. I stayed to myself. I was really like a loner. You know, I, when I got with someone I could talk to, I would really talk to them. But I was kind of a loner, which basically to this day I still am to a point. Like right now, you know, it's just me and my brother. He's already went to bed. And for those of you who watch this and seen my new photo uh, profile pictures here on you here on Facebook, that is of me and my brother JJ um, behind the cross. I don't usually put my own picture on Facebook, but um, standing up for God and standing with the cross because that's the cross that our Savior went on. I will do that because I'm standing boldly for the Lord, and I'm praying that someone in the homosexual lifestyle. Time, we're down to the last bit of seconds, really, literally, the last bit of time. And I'll tell you why I feel that here in a minute. First of all, I want to say that the lady that I was talking about, she was the pastor's wife. And she was one that was trying to teach us. And she said she knew that there was something, but she didn't know what, till years later, which was probably about five or six years ago when I told her about what happened to me as a child. It got to where I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Whenever I met somebody, I automatically, in my mind, well, I'm supposed to do something with them or they won't like me. So it got to a point where I didn't even think whether they liked me or not. I got to where I just did it to be doing it, you know. And many years went by that I, I went through this. Now, not every person I met, no, I didn't do anything with. But even when I was full, you know, full blown into the lifestyle, I had people I met I never touched that way. We became... Well, friends, but we didn't stay friends very long, if you know what I mean. 
And I remember growing up, the kids made fun of me all the time, making fun of me, calling me names, and a lot of wanted to fight me, which I never really fought. It really never fit nobody. Well, I did one person. I kind of remember running his head through the chalkboard because he called me a name, and I had tucking it all I could. It was in the ninth grade. Seen this person many years later, and at the time I was living in the lifestyle, but he could not have told because I was working, and I waited on him at a place I worked at. And um, I don't really remember ever really conversating with him or having a conversation with him. I just sold him a pack of cigarettes, which I know he was the age. He went to school with me, so he had to be old enough, and I was way more than old enough to buy cigarettes, so I didn't have to ID him. And um, I don't know if he really even really knew who I was, or if he did know, he didn't say anything. But anyway, I uh, there was a lot of pain involved in my life. I remember I was at a church function. At this time, it wasn't at the church, but it was a sister from the church had, and which now I don't believe in celebrating Halloween, but back then really there wasn't a lot of things taught against Halloween. But nowadays there are a lot of stuff that can show you that it's not for Christians. It's what's called All Hallow Eve. It, it is about the wicked. It's celebrating the, de the dead. And we as children of God don't celebrate dead. We celebrate life because our God is the God of life. Anyway, I was... In, in a haunted house, you know, playing in a haunted house. I was one of the characters in the haunted house. And I remember everybody was being called to the living room. Any other time, the man, the husband, the you know, the woman who was having her husband would be at work, but he was at home this time. I was about probably seven, eight years old when this person took my hand and he said, I know all about you. I know what you're about. He said, if you ever want to, you know, just look me up. Well, as a child, I forgot that. It went in the back of my mind. But many years later, this same person, when I was working at that convenience store, as a matter of fact, this person came back and made it known to me that they wanted to be involved with me. And I was trying to get it to make it to happen but God didn't want it to happen and I got to thinking about it after all was said and done I'm glad I didn't because I wouldn't want to come between him and his wife I mean she's a wonderful lady she was one of my Sunday school teachers very beautiful lady and at the time though I was living under the devil's influence of a demon you know like I told you in the other videos when I've done drag shows uh, female impersonation shows I know when I put that makeup on and that dress on that I was I wasn't Cecil anymore. I had become a different person. My attitude was different. My whole outlook was different. But deep inside, Cecil was really... I was fighting. I was fighting to get out. I didn't want to be with the, in that person, not even, even in uh, association with him. But I didn't know that to many years later. Matter of fact, it was quite a few years later because it was after, way after my mom and dad died. It was like in probably... Oh, I'm going to say 05, 06 that I started thinking about it. I was involved with a guy in 05, and his daughter came to live with us. And she was calling me daddy and called him dad. Well, one night, she came into the laundry room. I was doing laundry. She asked me for a blanket. And I looked at her. I said, why do you need a blanket? I said, it is, it's like, it's August. It's cold. It's hot outside. And she said, well, I need a blanket, so I gave her one. Because she had a, um, she had a real bad, like, you know what they would call, I guess, ADHD, uh, you know, attention deficit disorder, but she would, she would really lose it, and you had to watch her. Well, that night, I went to bed, locked the door, or closed the door to our bedroom. I never would lock it. She knocked on the door, and she said, Daddy, me. And I said, yeah. She said, come here, it's your cat. And I had a cat named Onyx. She was black and white, beautiful cat. This cat took, it really, it was my cat, you know. My, I had a cat and and I had a dog. But I had got, um, 
had gotten rid of the dog, I think, a little bit later after that, I got rid of the dog. But anyway, no, I got rid of the dog before. This was way before the cat, this cat happened to the cat. And it was a real strange feeling. I walked in her room. This may not seem like much to some of you, but it was to me because that cat was my baby. Okay, just like, just like this baby right here is my baby. That's my Char Michael. I love my cat. He knows he's loved too. I walked in the bedroom where she was at, and uh, my cat was dead in the floor with its mouth open, its eyes open, its claws out. It's all, it was obvious that she had killed my cat. She smothered my cat to death. And I wanted so much for her to be blamed for it that I even took my fingernails under her. her she had a little, sponge, like a sponge mattress she slept on because... I was pretty much footing all the bills there, and I hadn't got her a bed, but I couldn't afford all that stuff, you know. I had to, I couldn't do it. Now, she could, we had a futon in the living room she could have slept on, but she slept on that mattress in the floor. And I tucked my nails, and I wanted it. That's how bad the enemy is, you know. I'd never do that anymore. I don't let no one come around my animals or my bubby. Because my bubby don't talk. My little brother doesn't talk. It got to where I took a glass bell with a rubber band. And when I went to bed at night, I put it around my brother's door. So if she was to go in his room, that glass bell would ring. But I ended up doing something even better. This person was living with me. And anyone who's in a homosexual lifestyle, you're not being loved. That's demons communion with each other. And they're going to go against each other because the wicked does not get along. It's not like the loving God and all of us that are in God that love one another because God loves through us. No, the devil comes to lie, kill, and destroy. And his, he's the master of hate and, and lying. And this person, her, her dad I was with, I never felt that I was being treated right by him. I know I was being done wrong. For, to be in, a, in some sort of a relationship that you think someone cares for you, they wouldn't cheat on you, I never felt secure with him. Okay, I felt he was... He was uh, cheating. And there was many reasons. Yes, he was. I don't think I ever, ever had anyone in that life to be truthful to me. But see, there's one in my life now called Jesus Christ. He never cheats on me. Never. He is, the, he is my Lord, my Savior, my hero, my everything. He's my first love. And he, ha he has so much love that he doesn't just have to love me. He loves everyone who comes to him. Because he loved us so much, he died on the cross for us. That's This is where I'm coming from. How I know that Jesus Christ loves me because of... Because he does. Everything in my life that has changed, it's because he He loves me. And... Um, I... Um, I just remember that, um, hold on a second, I want to see where my heating pad is, because I really, really, really need my heating pad, and I don't know where it's at, but I can continue talking to you guys while I'm looking for it, okay? I'm just going to put it up like that for a second. Anyway, like I was saying, you know, my, my Lord and Savior, he really did, well, I'm about to get up here, he really did show me how much he loves me, because it was only through him that I was able to find true love, and that was with him. Because there is no love without him. I mean, you could say, oh, I love you, love you, love you to anybody, but it's not without Jesus. And I know that for a fact. Without Jesus, there is no love. But getting back to what I was saying, when I was in this lifestyle, okay? Um, now, I, um, I was in the lifestyle for, from the time I was... From the time I was probably, I was molested when I was four. And in and out through my childhood, the lifestyle flared in my life many times. But to be openly in it, I'd say when I hit my teen years, I met this person. And this person, for some reason, this person, which was a man, stole my heart to a point that I would cry if I wasn't around him. And when I was around him, I couldn't stand him. And I realized what that was. It was the devil using him to hold me down, 
because now I don't let anybody, I don't have the desire to have, you know, a girlfriend in my life, which I did have one. I've had girlfriends, and I allowed the enemy, I had two, I had a fiancé, one fiancé I know that truly loved me. And I allowed that whole, that whole relationship to go down the tube because of me believing that I had to be with a man, not a woman. And, and I can tell you now, every time I think about, about what I did in that lifestyle, it makes me sick and I want to puke, okay? All because someone, when I was four years old, took advantage of a four-year-old child. Four years old. Four. Four years before that, I was a newborn baby. And now they're trying to want to pass a law where a grown man can have their way with children. That's not right. They're also trying to pass a law where kids learn anal sex, you know, oral and anal, in, in, at the, in the age of eighth grade. I mean, you know, no. It's like my cousin said, they're taking away the innocence of the children. You know, I, I can't say there isn't people out there that knows how I feel because there is ex, there is homosexuals that are ex from that lifestyle. And some of them have not come to the Lord. And they need to, okay? They need to come to the Lord. But they need not to call themselves an ex. Like I said yesterday, if you come to Christ and you're a new creature, you're a new creature, a new man, a new man through Christ, you are no longer an ex nothing. Because that old life, old lifestyle, God does not remember it. Why should you? Okay? And I don't remember it. I don't want to. There's things in that lifestyle. Like right now, while I'm talking to you, I'm remembering some stuff, okay? I remember being at home most of the time by myself. I remember fr feeling like this guy I watched earlier, uh, The Power of Jesus to, uh, you know, to Overcome Homosexuality was basically what it was. But the, what I want to say is is that this, um, I remember being at home in my bedroom crying, feeling that no one cared about me. No one ever loved me. No one ever cared what I had to say. And when it comes to the world, they don't. But I had brothers and sisters out there that look up to me because... God uses me. He gave me a gift to teach and, and, and to bring joy and happiness and even laughter into people's lives. Because God gave me a gift of, of, of comedy that I could be very comical for people to laugh at. But at this time in my life, people were laughing at me and seeing me as comical because I would do things to get attention. Nowadays, it's like I do it only to make people laugh. But back then, I had to do it because I felt like if I wasn't the, the main scene around people that... People would not know me. And now I don't care if people see me or not because I don't, I'm not here to please people no more, you know. But anyway, as I was, as I was growing up in my childhood, um, I remember I never really felt secure. And if I would leave a so-called friend's house, in my mind, I would think, is that person talking about me now? Are they, are they talking me down like I'm a piece of trash? You know, I never felt loved by friends because I remember when we were growing up, our friends always had better things than we did. And looking back, I'm glad we had what we had. I'm glad we got, you know, hand-me-downs on the things that we got because that made us to respect what we have now. I mean, my my house is not full of fancy furniture, and if, and if the Lord tarries, it ain't going to even have the living room suit that's here now. I'm getting me a recliner to put in here and a possibly a used a used couch that someone's got that I'm going to purchase for a cheap price to not have all this money going out over this furniture. And it's not nothing really to look at. I mean, it, my house is just a home, you know. I mean, I'll give you a look at it. Here you go. This is my living room. That's that's my shelf with my fax machine on it, my end tables, which are old, the couch. And that right there, there's my kitchen. That's my brother's recliner. This is our um, our TV right there, and it don't even play good half the time. It it messes up. It kicks off and stuff. And that right there is an antique stereo that someone gave me. And, of course, there's my Christian flag. And then there is this chair that I'm sitting in here, which you can see. The chair with my cat on the corner. And that's my window with my curtains on it. So you can see. And, and the rest of our house is about the same. There's nothing fancy about our home. It's just a home. And I'm happy. I don't want any ritzy, fancy things. I love what we have. I, I feel blessed to have the roof over my head. I feel blessed to, to know that I have a God that loves me. And I fight a lot. The enemy comes against all of us that are truly seeking God. He'll come against you. But getting back to us, I'll just show you what I have. You know, I'm, I haven't got no fancy house and don't want a fancy house. Don't want it. But anyway, um, 
I tell you guys all the time that God brought me from out of the homosexual lifestyle. Well, I'm here to tell you how bad it was, was the fact when I had a friend I looked up to. That friend was a drag queen or a female impersonation, impersonator. That very person came against me when I was trying to talk to my own nephew and tell him to come out of that lifestyle. And he said, just because you didn't, the, the person, just because you wasn't cut out for it, just because, yeah, because you weren't cut out for it, don't don't be talking to your nephew like that. He has a right to follow his life. And I'm, I just thought to myself, who are you to be saying that? You know? And I remember I blocked that person on Facebook. I don't talk to him or nothing anymore. His mom passed away in 06, or his step, his adopted mom. It wasn't his real mom. She was his, um, she was blood kin, but she wasn't his mom. She adopted him because he was a little younger than her children. So, but anyway, and I loved her dearly. And I pray that she gave her heart to God because she was such a wonderful lady. But you don't know what people have done when they get to their deathbed and when they die. Like a person I know that I was involved with in that lifestyle again, who took advantage of me, stole things from me, took advantage of me. He stole, he stole, uh, he had his parent, his mom, put her, not this not the person I'm talking about, this is a person I was involved with. Never was involved with that person. But this person I was involved with died March, May the 30th of this year. He passed away just last month. And, well, uh, a month, a month ago today he passed away. And, uh, he, um, oh Lord Jesus, help me, God, please help me, Lord Jesus, please help me. His mom and put her gas and cable in my name and ran it up. Then after we were no longer talking to each other, he and I, they tried to go to a rental company that I got furniture through, which is actually the same furniture rental company I got this furniture through. Been dealing with them for over 20 years. <coughs> around, around that, about 20 years anyway. No, it's just real close to 20 years. But anyway, they went there to try to get furniture. Well, little did they know, little did they know I was still, you know, uh, dealing with them. And the manager of the store at the time I was dealing with it, it was in the other my hometown. They called and told me what was going on. And I said, Oh no! I said, Uh. -uh. I said, No. Mm -mm. I said, I'm no longer around him. He said, I didn't think so. So, and I think I'd already told him, don't let him get anything on my account because I was no longer talking to him. But he knew better anyway. He wasn't gonna let it happen. But anyway, they tried to take advantage of me there, and it didn't work. I had death threats and everything from them. I had to quit a good job. I had Well, back then, I wouldn't consider it good now because I don't think the company is worth anybody working for, but that was Walmart. But uh, I worked for Walmart in, uh, in 90, 94. No, I'm sorry, 90, 98, I worked for Walmart. And uh, close to 20 years ago since I worked for them. But anyway, I... Uh, was in my early 20s, or late 20s, rather, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, I was in my late, mid, tw mid to late 20s. I was like probably 20, 28, 20, 26, 20, 20, 26 and 28. But anyway, that's not important. But at that time, I was working with a lady. And uh, she was really a sweetheart of a lady. Her name was Debbie. She... She loved me so much, and she said that I was a good guy, and I didn't deserve what was happening to me. This is when I was seeing this guy that tried to take advantage of me, his mom, and then put, you know, the one that died last month. I remember she was so upset with him. She said if he can't get away from him, she was like at the point, she said, I'll do something to him. Because she knew he was hurting me. She knew I was being used, and she, and she knew I was too good of a person to be done that way. Everyone I've ever been with, has they always used me. I never had except for the girl I dated, who I was engaged to. She was kind of um, one to be the pants wearer in the family. and That's not what God says. And I don't care if people get mad or not. Unless the woman's living on her own, taking care of her children, she is everything to that household. And if there is a man in the house, the man needs... And he is her husband, the father, or the dad of the house, then he needs to take control of the house. If he's a stepdad, he needs to take control of the house. The woman needs to be loved and cared for and not to be put on out there to do everything herself. She shouldn't have to be straining herself to make decisions on her own. Uh, this should be an equal. An equal, you know, the man should be doing the work and taking care of the wife. I realize these days there's two income households and they have to be, which that's also a trick of the, of the devil too because he goes, people go out into the world and they start listening to circular music whether they listen to it or not 
or they're up late at night and they see things on TV and they start ordering them. Before they know it, they're in so much debt or the junk mail, you know, your, your, I call it your, yeah, your junk mail, your flyers and stuff you get in the mail, and you start ordering stuff. Before you know it, you've got all these bills coming, and there's no way the money the man's making is going to make it, even though he's working two jobs. The woman has to go out and find a job and work too. And even then, and then it leaves them not being around their children and their children with babysitters. And that's what sometimes causes homosexuality, because sometimes the babysitter has their moment where they just don't care and they do what they want to just to please the flesh. That's basically how it happened to me. Only it wasn't a babysitter, but it was my babysitter's brother that did it. Well, yeah, actually, I had his sister and his brother, which from what I hear, his brother's deceased now. So, But he also even tried it, too. But he didn't. He was joking. Well, he said he was joking. But I think he got a conscience. You know, his conscience kicked in, and he stopped. But it still hurts to know that these people took advantage of me and and I look back and I know the only reason why they did care it was the devil the only why, reason why they cared because it was self they were self pleasing themselves okay and and ends up messing my whole life up you know I lived most of my adulthood well up till I was in my late 30s before I realized that that wasn't who I was when God took me out of it and and since then for the last it was about 38 I started realizing, and the, my 39th birthday, well, that's my 39th birthday, September the 23rd, as a matter of fact, of 2008, yeah, 2008, I was um, was in my house, and I, I lived in uh, Beckley, West Virginia. I had someone I was dating at the time, too, but I just didn't feel, it didn't feel right that I was supposed to be there. I was having a lot of problems help my health-wise. I am... God pulled me out of it. He took me from drinking. And I mean, I was a major drinker. I would get up in the morning and start drinking liquor because I couldn't stand not being with somebody. And even if I was with somebody, when they weren't around, I was sick of being with them. You know, you never, I never was happy. And I would I would get the liquor. I'd get these half-gallon liquor, keep them hidden in my counter. And no one never knew because I never done it around anybody. If anybody came around, I wasn't feeling like I just wouldn't answer the door. If I did answer it, I acted pretty, you know, pretty much just, hey, how you doing? They could tell I was buzzing, but, you know, who cared? That's the way I felt. Who cared? Now I, they come and see me. I don't buzz. I don't do nothing like that no more. I am totally all about my Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I come on here to tell people about the lie of the devil, saying that homosexuality is who you were born. You were not born that way. If if you are doing it, and somewhere along your line, either you didn't fit in anywhere, and you went around some gay people, and they made you feel welcome, and that's why you started being that way, well, just let me tell you that the devil led you into that one way or another, whether it was trickery or it was molestation. You were being let, you were led in by the lie, by the master of liars, Satan himself. And I know, I was hurt. I know there was this guy uh, back years ago. His name was Johnny. He lived his life as a woman. Well, kind of as a woman. Now he had a twin brother, but his twin brother looked like a man and kept his hair cut short. But where? You would see the one named Johnny. You automatically just pictured him being because they looked identical, except for hair. One hair is long, one hair sh one hair is short. One of their hair is long, one hair is short. Well, the one who was in the lifestyle, he got to a point where he was just not happy nowhere, no how. Okay, and he sounded like a girl too. Now his brother didn't, but he was found dead in his car. They don't know what happened. He took his own life for what? And there's been a lot. There was this one person I know. They went by the names, the name of Prudence, and they were, they were brutally murdered. Murdered. And people said it was robbery, but all the money that he had was right there in his apartment still after he was murdered. They said it was the most gruesome scene of a murder in Charleston, West Virginia. It happened like in the late 90s. His name was James somebody. And then there's. There's just been all kinds of stuff that's happened, you know, in that lifestyle. And, and these people that died in that lifestyle, they aren't, no matter if it was a brutal death, they didn't come to the Lord. And unless they were, you know, not at the, you know, at the, at the age of accountability or being able to account for their own, because some people's mind is not normal. And in that case, I don't, it, that's between God and them, you know. But... And a lot of people say, well, anybody in that lifestyle? No, people know it's wrong. I knew probably about, I'd say probably a year or a little over a year before God delivered me out of it. 
I knew that I was doing wrong, and I knew that it was not of God. I was living in an apartment, uh, probably about three or four counties over, or about two county, county, couple counties over from where I'm at now. And um, I was talking to this person. We were just friends. I mean, there was nothing more we could be but friends. That was it, just friends. And um, and he's a nice guy. And but he he ran it off this girl who was also she was a um, niece to the minister that preached my mom and dad's funeral, and that was just about probably four years or three years prior to me living there, because mom and dad died in '02 and this was in '05, and uh, and she was telling me that you know you should come to our church. We got a preacher that's in in the homosexual life, and this was an apostolic church. I was like, what? I even knew it myself. I said, the Apostolic Church is letting homosexuals in there to preach. I said, oh. And I knew it was not right. I said, that's not a church. At first, I was going to get all gun-ho and go to it. And I thought, that's not even a church. And then, you know, it's like, she was saying, he don't, he don't, uh, he ain't prejudiced against nobody or racist or nothing like that. He, he believes everybody can be saved. Well, yeah, if you come to God and drop your sin, yeah, you can. And then it was back in 08 when I was with the last person I ever was with in that lifestyle. And it's been seven years, and I thank God every day that I'm clear. I don't need any of it. This guy was uh, working, and I kept questioning myself. Why am I not happy? Why am I not happy? I mean, you know, I said, God, I've got a beautiful home. I've got a loving little brother. I've got a nice man in my life. And God was, I could picture looking at me saying, I don't care about that man in your life, you know. But the house was a blessing from God because of Jason, because Jason belonged to God. And he had a, we had a beautiful home. And I remember I was sitting in our living room, and I said, God, when was I ever happy? And he showed me a picture of myself, or more like a vision of a dream. I could see the actual movement of us doing this. And uh, I was about probably nine or ten years old. And um, I was at a neighbor's house, and we were using her front porch steps because her house, if you went to the back porch, it only had a few steps because her house was built into the hill, and her back, her yard kind of ran down to the front. But when you got to the front, you had to walk up a bunch of steps to get on her front porch. And I remember um, we were sitting on the front porch, and we were singing uh, choir songs and gospel songs. And uh, I seen myself smiling and having fun. I said, you know, I was happier when I was serving you. This is from God. I mean, it's from God, you know. And I remember I was sitting there, and one night the guy that I was with, that I was dating at the time, he said, why aren't you sleeping in there with me? I said, I just can't. I can't. And uh, eventually I told him, I said, you know, we need to start going to church. And I remember I was in the bedroom one night with him, and I was calling around churches, and I called this Unitarianist church, which the Unitarianist church is the ones that accept gays, uh, atheists, whatever, it don't matter, you're, or not atheists, but gays, and whatever, you can be anything and be, you know, of God. And I called there, and as I was listening to their answer machine, and they were talking about our parking is around back, we meet, blah, 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 I heard inside, that's not our church, or that's, no, that's not my church. And it was God telling me, that's not my church. So I continued looking and stuff, and I think it was that night uh, he had went to work, uh, the guy that I was living with me. At this time, I guess you could say, pretty much it was just like we were friends. You know, I didn't, I was at the point I didn't know what to do, but I know I didn't want to be with him. And I didn't want to be with anybody, I guess. And I remember I was sitting in, it was either that night or a few nights later, I remember I was sitting in the living room, and he was gone. And I was listening to uh, what used to be known as uh, I'm going to I'm trying to think what channel it was Living Faith TV Living Faith TV and that was a Christian channel that was in our area and there was this altar call you don't see that anymore on very, very many TVs or very and I actually found Living Faith on my computer but um, you don't you don't see that anymore you don't see very many altar calls on television of you know ministries. But they had a tele they had an altar call, and I walked up beside my TV. I had to, I had like a, it was a floor model, or some kind of TV. I don't know what it was, but anyway, I walked up and I had this little, like, 
it was like it looked like a half of a stereo. It was like a shelf you open up, and it had like shelves inside, and it was like a, a half of a hexagon, you know, half of a stop sign type shape. And I walked up to it, and I had it decorated with lamps and or like lamp and stuff on it. And I knelt down beside it, and I prayed to God. And I remember at that point in time when I was when I was praying to God, I remember feeling as if someone had cracked an, like an egg. And the yoke came running over me, but it wasn't a, a slimy yoke. It was a like a force field around me. Okay? Like someone had basically opened one of them fans you used to use, you know, to fan yourself with. It was like someone opened one of them, but only it only going so far, wasn't it? Went completely around me, and I felt this shield of protection around me. No one could penetrate, or no one could do nothing to me in this shield. And I remember everything around me seemed new. Nothing seemed the same anymore. And I remember that night, he came in from work, and he went to bed, and I was in the chair. And it was like a couple of nights later, I was in the chair in, in my brother's recliner, and I remember I fell asleep around 3 o'clock in the morning. There, I left the TV playing on the Christian channel, and I woke up, and I'm thinking even right down my front door was open, but my storm door was locked, okay? And uh, I woke up, or maybe it may not have been, I can't remember. But anyway, I woke up, and I thought I, 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 I had done wrong to the Lord, and I woke up hollering and shouting, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I fell back to sleep. But and that was just something I wanted to fit, you know, put in there. But I want to get back to another part real quickly before I end this because I I got a little bit of time. Twelve minutes. I go back in the chat room for a little bit. I wanted to tell you guys about um, the night that the the girl killed my cat. Well, it was like a couple of nights later. My brother was staying at my 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 then friend's house, which is still in the lifestyle. We don't talk anymore. Uh, God, God has removed him out of my life, and I do pray for him. I've talked to him a couple of times, like when I first moved here, but after that, I don't talk to him anymore. I've tried to add him on Facebook, but they don't. Add, they may. They said they added me, but they're not being. They're not coming on my friends list. So God doesn't want him on my friends list. So I still pray for him and everything. I've even had dreams of her and stuff. But anyway, about her like storms and stuff coming. So I don't know. But the last picture I saw of her, she looked empty. I mean, she her eyes looked empty. You could just. There looked like there was no life there, okay? But anyway, my brother was staying with her. And I was in my brother's bedroom. And I remember I had the door closed. And I was in her. I was so scared. I was terrified to be around these people. Now, I think at the time, if I'm not mistaken, his daughter had been put in a um, psycho psycho psychiatry, psychiatry ward. Like, she, was, she, went, she went, she lost it, and they put her in a psych ward. That's it, psych ward. And um, she was in there for like probably about almost three weeks or so. Well, he had went to stay with a friend while she was in there. And I think I may have went a couple of times to see her, just so she had someone coming to see her and everything. And uh, I remember talking to her and everything, but it was like everything was just not... It just wasn't... There was no, there was no connection there after all. But I remember the night before he went to pick her up, or maybe she was there. I believe she was there. She had gotten out. They were getting ready to leave the next day to go back to Ohio. And I was, like, in my brother's room crying, talking to my friend from Charleston. I just told her, I said, I'm really scared. I said, I, I don't feel comfortable in this place at all. And he, the next morning he looked at me and he said, well, why did you not sleep with me last night? I said, what's the use to sleep with you when there's nothing there? Why even be worried about it, you know? And I remember he said something the day before, something he said. He said, well, he said, we're going to stay with you till such and such, and then we're going to move back out there. And I was like, no, why even wait? Just go ahead and move out there now because, there, you know, if there's nothing here, why stay here? What he's basically going to do is stay there on me living free, and I'll just pretty much put it, no, you ain't, in a, in a very nice and mild way. And I remember, because that's what it's about most of the time, well, all the time I feel, it's about someone using somebody. And if they actually work together, then it's more of a friendship, but they, didn't, they, they looked over the friendship and made it something much more demonic than a friendship, okay? But anyway, I hope I'm helping somebody with this, okay? I was always empty, feeling like there was nothing for me. There was no one loved me. No one cared for me. No one cared about my opinion. Nobody wanted nothing to do with me. I spent time in rooms with myself just crying, crying out, why am, I, why am I going through this? Why do I feel this way? Why am I doing this? And it wasn't until God came into my life that he showed me that that wasn't who I was. I was his child. I was living out of the flesh because I came to God when I was young, and I was baptized like back in 82, or 
Nate went eight. Yeah, it was 82. I was about probably 12, 13 years old. So it was 80, 80 or 82 or 83 I was baptized. I said 82, that's right. I got baptized, but then again, you know, of course, not having anybody to teach you anything because the woman that taught me, she had already moved far away, and I was going to several different kinds of churches trying to find a church that would learn me. And I never found a church that would teach me. They were all preaching and everything, but no one wanted to take time to break down things for a child, you know. And that led me further away. I'm like, you know, why can't I? Well, it wasn't until I reached my late 30s that I came to God. And when I first came to God, I didn't understand the Bible or nothing, but I kept reading and I kept seeking. And I didn't know at the time I was seeking, but I was because God gave me all kinds of knowledge of the Bible, of the Word, of His love. And his love is something you just can't deny because his love is so strong. It is so real that you know it's of God, okay? And when he gave that love to me, I knew there was no other love. There wasn't no love in my life before. And I remember I got re I made them move. And I'll tell you something happened when um, we were supposed to take his daughter to somewhere to a some kind of hospital in a certain month of the next month. And we didn't have a real good car at the time. I had a Plymouth Acclaim, and it was pretty high in miles. I mean, it run good, but yet, you know what I'm saying. And I remember I took him and dropped him off in Ohio with that Acclaim and come back home. Little car run good. I mean, it was a nice little car for an older car. God gave me that car, really. Even though you know everything good happened to me, God gave me, because God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And... I was on just, but Jason needed a car, so God gave me that car. Just like this one we got now, God blessed us with that, and he blessed us both because it's a nicer car than I've ever had. You know, Jason Jason doesn't care what he rides in as long as it gets him where he's going. Me, I don't care either, but now we've got a beautiful vehicle. God gave us, but you know what? I'm so ready to go home, I don't care. Anyway, I remember um, Coming home from all this situation that was going on and, and dropping them off and coming home. And I remember I cleansed. I mean, I went through my whole house bleaching and cleaning and making my home mine again. And I remember for the first time in my life, even from before I was ever, ever met this person, I felt free. I felt free. And then I ended up getting someone else in my life that I had been with before that did nothing but hurt me and treat me like a dog or treat me like, you know, like I was dirt. And I got him back in my life, and, and it was the same thing, on and off, on and off. Well, in '05 was the last time I saw him. Never talked to him again. I think I may have talked to him because he called my cell phone when he had my number. But after that, I got rid of the cell phone. He has never had my number. He doesn't know where I'm at, and I have no intentions of him ever knowing where I'm at. That he he wanted to get he wanted to get back in touch with me, wanted to be around me. I was like, mm -mm, I can't do that, you know. I'm, I actually was telling him I was living at the beach, and I was living in Beckley. Now, I do think there was a few times I was sitting on my front porch when I used to smoke in Beckley, and I think I seen him go through with a, on the car with a bunch of people. But I just sat there and didn't, didn't dare look at him or nothing. I just stayed real quiet and didn't even look at him. And who knows, he may have, you know, Google mapped or whatever and found where I was at, but he never did come around me. So I just, I'll put this way. It, many years later, I still haven't talked to him. I've got him blocked on Facebook several he's got several Facebook accounts every one of his Facebook accounts are blocked on my Facebook matter of fact I think I'll check later and make sure if he has any more I'll block them too um, but a lot of a lot of things have changed since way, since then since back about eight years well seven eight years ago but I tell you what the last person I was ever with I, I, I helped him through a tough time he lost his mom and he, he never really his dad died years before but he never really knew his dad from what I understand that he lost his mom, and I was with him when he lost his mom. And I'll just put it this way. It was me. I was a pallbearer for her funeral and lowering her casket into the ground. I remember when I came home, and it was like from then on, every time I tried to sleep, I would see that casket going down on the ground. And I knew that casket was representing me going down in the ground, and the life I was living in, I was heading to hell. God was telling me if I died, I was going to hell. I mean, I feared going past the funeral home. I feared going past the, It didn't matter. I feared it. Even before I met him, I feared these places. Okay, I feared them. And I remember now I can go past the graveyard or funeral home, and I'm like, there's no fear over me anymore because I know when I get there that my troubles are over. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with God after that. And I know being with God is going to be the best blessing I could ever have. 
If you're living in the lifestyle of homosexuality, know this, it is a lie from the devil. I have made this a long video, but I hope that there's something in this video that will tell you that it is a lie. Maybe there's some things I've told you about feeling like hurt or people taking advantage of. Maybe it's happened to you too. Maybe it will recall or bring, a, bring to memory something that happened to you that showed it, that you were not born that way. I'm just going to ask you right now, please, 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 ask Jesus into your heart. I believe we're at, we're at the very threshold. I believe this Bethlehem star that's in the sky from the 28th till the 4th of July, I believe that is a sign of Jesus' return to take his bride because the first Bethlehem star, he came as a babe to become the Messiah, to become our Messiah, our promised one, our Savior, our Lord, and that his blood would atone for our sins. He's coming back again, and I, I believe this Bethlehem star that's shining now in the skies at night, I believe it was even here at my house last night. I truly believe it was outside my house last night because at 2 o'clock this morning, I saw my blinds were almost lit up like you see them right now. Not quite that light, but almost that light at 2 o'clock in the morning. Get just maybe about three shades darker, and you would have exactly what it was. I'm talking about it was, you could tell it was outside. You could probably walk outside and see everything. Not, you could see, uh, yeah. It was like, there was like some, like a bright moon. I mean, the brightest the moon was up there, and the moon was out, but it wasn't that bright. And my cousin saw it too in her house. I'm just telling you right now, brothers and sisters, I believe the Bethlehem star coming in the sky is a sign that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming again. And you remember when he came from the Bethlehem star before he went back to heaven again? Well, he's coming this time in the clouds. And he's going to take us who are ready, who have called upon his name. We're getting ready to go home, brothers and sisters. We're getting ready to go home. Be ready because it could be any moment now. I believe it's seven days that the, the star is going to be up. And I believe it was seven days. Or maybe it was maybe it was years up to that point. But I'm saying it was seven is completion. But I believe that, that this Bethlehem star that's in the, in the sky at night, I believe that is God's way of showing us Jesus is coming back. It was the way, it was the what, what led the, the, um, the shepherds to, the, to the, where he was at when he was born in the manger. That's where it, they, it led him to the manger where he was at, the bright star did. And I believe that the bright star is so when Jesus comes. It's another sign telling us the promise. That, that star was the promise of the Messiah being born. And now it's another promise of the Messiah coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to take us home. And it's any moment now. We don't have very much time left at all. The world is close to an economical collapse. The world is close to, uh, to everything happening. I mean, the same-sex marriage and all that stuff. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's been many of things happen due to deal with fire. The, the, the earth is crying out for God to destroy it because it doesn't like the sin. It wasn't made for sin. And now that there is sinful, uh, a sinful covenant being went against God, and that's the homosexual life of being married, you know, same-sex marriage, it's against God. So I'm just going to say right now, please, please, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior and you feel something in your heart telling you that you don't belong in that lifestyle, then kneel and ask God in your heart. And if this happens to be that you're listening to us in the middle of the tribulation when everything's going wrong, know that God brought you here. If it's still... if, if, if YouTube circuit and the YouTube Christian videos are even still up then, then know that God brought you to this channel, even if you're at it now, before the rapture. God brought you here to let you know He loves you. He loves you. And yes, He loves you. But He don't know you. If you don't come to Father God through Jesus Christ and be washed in the blood of the Lamb, you cannot be saved. Take the time now and ask Jesus in your heart. There's no time like today because you're not promised tomorrow. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Keep looking up for your redemption draweth nigh. We love you here at Last Chance Ministries, but God loves you more. After all, he did send his only begotten son to die for you. No man on this earth will give his life for you. Please, call on Jesus now. And know that the life you're living in is a lie. God bless you. See you soon with Jesus. And I hope this helps somebody. Lord Jesus, let eyes be opened in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought it was going to be a lot more emotional, but... Surely was long, but I hope it helps somebody. God bless.